Welcome back to Viewpoint. I'm Jim Zogby. My next guest, Rami Khoury, is director of the Assam Ferris Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut, also editor at large of the Daily Star newspaper in Beirut, Lebanon, published throughout the Middle East. He's internationally syndicated political columnist and author and co-recipient of the 2006 Pax Christi International Peace Prize. Thanks for joining us. You're here in Washington at the Woodrow Wilson Center right now. Right. Uh, I, I, going to get you back again before you leave and go back to <laughs> Lebanon. Thanks for, for being with us. My pleasure. Well, let me start with Lebanon. Uh, new government um, uh, with Hezbollah getting its what they call blocking third. We've talked about that on the show before. They'll, they'll have enough seats in the cabinet to be able to block decisions they don't like. The question is, how fragile is the situation? And and will the government be able to act or is there is this a recipe for permanent paralysis? Uh, no, it's not a recipe for problems. They have a blocking third, but uh, the other two thirds have a blocking two thirds. So we shouldn't exaggerate this as being a you know sort of Hezbollah government. Um, Hezbollah actually appointed one minister. The other ten are from its allies, some of whom are mm -hmm. Christians. But Hezbollah, basically, it and its allies now have a, a proportionately fair share of power in the cabinet, reflecting their share of power in society, both at the demographic level, the electoral level, and the military and political power. In Society. So blocking so, third doesn't mean that they can sideline any decision they don't like. Only the major strategic decisions have to be done by two-thirds majority. So if, for instance, Lebanon decides to uh, open peace talks with Israel or throw out the American embassy or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, big, big sticker stuff, uh, you have to have two-thirds majority. Uh, and the main reason they wanted that is to make sure that the government doesn't take a decision to, say, try to forcibly disarm them. Because being an armed resistance movement is key to their... Uh, strategy. So they now, you now have a government which has to work by consensus, which always was the case more or less. Mm -hmm. well, let's talk about the events of the last couple of days, uh, a prisoner exchange program. I, I kind of thought that the cover of the New York Times uh, said it all, the two pictures that were on the front of the Times. One was the, the two bodies of the Israelis going back and the mourning parents, and then this was the uh, picture of Samir Kuntar, who's been there since he was 16 years old, was involved in a, a terrorist attack that killed a father and a four-year-old daughter, and a, another baby died in the attack, um, comes home hero. It, 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 what was weird when you think about it is that both sides got what they wanted in the sense that Israel gets sympathy and compassion for the world as victim of terror, and Hezbollah gets a domestic victory as being the, 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 the liberators. But the PR consequences of that for Lebanon, um, this doesn't look so good. Well, it's really a mixed um, mixed situation. But first of all, I have to make an editorial correction. Sure. We in the newspaper business don't call it the cover. We call it the front page. Yeah. Covers what magazines do. <laughs> um, but it's a mixed picture. Um, the um, the uh, Lebanese as a whole, um, um, many of them are proud of what Hezbollah has been able to achieve in terms of its power in forcing Israel to exchange prisoners after Israel could not f bring their prisoners home through the war that it launched after the prisoners were snatched by Hezbollah. So at one level, there's a kind of a sense that this Hezbollah was able to force Israel to do something it didn't want to do. Uh, at the same time, Hezbollah is face facing a lot more resistance in Lebanon. More and more Lebanese are speaking out, criticizing it in a way they didn't do three or four or five years ago. It's also hemmed in uh, politically and militarily. The Lebanese army, the UNIFIL forces in the south of Lebanon, give it less maneuverable room for maneuver in the south. Uh, so uh, Hezbollah has achieved a lot of uh, successes, whether you like them or don't like them. They've achieved a lot of successes in terms of their military resistance, but there's less and less of that for them to do now, and they have to sh shift over or switch into a more political mode, which is exactly what they're doing, they, they're not as experienced in politics as they are at resistance. So they're learning a lot of things. So they're riding high, but somewhat constrained. Right. And, but so is Israel. Israel mm -hmm. is, the, is a very powerful country. And what it learned in the summer of 2006 is that all of its power, A, does not scare people like Hezbollah or other Arabs like Hamas and others. B, that people like Hezbollah and Hamas are not only willing to fight it, but are technically more proficient to be able to do so. So everybody is learning the limits of their military power, as is the U.S., by the way. I, I want to talk about Israel, the U.S., and this whole dynamic uh, next uh, leads us right into it. Th there's an interesting set of developments taking place um, for a number of years now, since the Bush administration got in, 
in, got into its we don't talk to them mode. Um, the effort to isolate Iran, isolate Syria, isolate Hezbollah, isolate Hamas. Um, and, and here we are today, Israel making a prisoner exchange with Hezbollah, negotiating a prisoner exchange with Hamas talking to Syria through the intermediary uh, role of, Syria, of, of Turkey and, and France as well, and Iran sitting at a meeting with a U.S. official uh, negotiating uh, new terms for their uh, agreement to suspend their nuclear program. There are those in the Middle East who suspect there's some conspiracy going on here. America couldn't have bungled it that badly that now they're on the defensive. Um, but what is it? It, it, it? Did Iran and Syria win this round? Did the U.S. lose? Is there a, 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 a sense of a different strategy going on here? Have the tables turned? There is an entirely new dynamic that is taking place here, very different than what we were seeing play out several years ago. That's right. You're, you're, you're correct. There is a whole new dynamic, and it's based on um, what I think is the single most important political development in the Middle East, not just the Arab world, but the whole Middle East, including Iran and Turkey, the single most important development of the last generation, uh, which is the um, determination of large numbers of people, probably two, three hundred million people, who are no longer docile and passive. They're not going to sit around and watch their country being occupied or to be attacked and watch this on CNN and Jazeera and do nothing about it. You've got lots and lots of people who have taken their fate into their own hands. That's represented by Islamist movements, peaceful ones, resistance movements, all kinds of signs that people are not going to sit around and acquiesce in their own marginalization and subjugation and occupation. That process has generated a lot of people who fight back against Israel, against the U.S., against uh, British army, against uh, Arab autocratic regimes, or whatever they feel is their, uh, the, whoever they feel is, is, is their problem. And they fight back. And what's happened is with the Iranians as well chipping in, you've got to draw now. It's not a question of the Americans losing. I think it's not accurate to say the U.S. has lost. So maybe uh, in some specific areas, like supporting the Lebanese government, supporting Abu Mazen in Palestine, uh, they didn't achieve what they wanted. Clearly, that's the case. But what's happened is you've got a draw now. You have a large number of people who are resisting and challenging the U.S. and Israel and Arab regimes in some cases, and a large number of people who are with the U.S. fighting the other way. They've fought each other militarily, politically, economically, socially, in every way, and they realize that they're pretty evenly matched. So what you have is a stalemate. Mm -hmm. uh, and what you have also is a lot of smart people in the Middle East, Arabs, Israelis, Iranians. They're not stupid people. Uh, they're smart. They see there's a stalemate. They live it. They know it better than some of the zealots here in Washington and London and other places. So they're coming to terms with the realities of their own region in a way that people in the United States, or at least in the Washington, required th two or three years longer to do. So I think that's what's happening.